Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. You could please take your seats for our next session. That would be great. Our next session is transitioning to sustainable practices to reduce marine debris. And the first project is Cape Cod Coalition to shift tourism businesses to sustainable service serviceware by Adam Gracia. Hey everybody, how we doing? Hey! Your legs. Uh, so, Cape Cod uh, Coalition to Aid Tourism Businesses, I won't say the whole thing, but, uh, and this is a collaborative partnership with Huey Sea Grant, uh, it was great to see the Woods Hole represented earlier on today, amazing institution, uh, as well as the Center for Coastal Studies, Laura Ludwig is up as a rock star. Uh, next slide, please. Can you please hold the microphone? Um, just send them uh, some marketing stuff so we can just jump to the next slide. And I think it's important to lead with this because we can't do the work that we do without staff, without supporters, without volunteers. Uh, so this uh, in the sunglasses, in the, the, the blazer, if you will, or the bib, that's Haley O'Neill. She is our new program manager that is focused on this grant. She comes from a sustainable background. She's an advocate. She also works in the hospitality industry. She's also been an oyster farmer. She's also um, a hospitality service worker. So the perfect advocate and leader to communicate this message. Next to her is Stephanie Murphy. She's the communications uh, specialist with Huey Sea Grant, an, an incredible educator and communicator. In the center, Jill Talladay is uh, the Care for Cape Islands executive, uh, former executive director and our founder. We were founded to promote environmental stewardship in support of tourism. Tourism is a significant industry for the Cape and Islands. It's vital, but we need to implement that industry in a responsible, sustainable manner. Otherwise, you know, it's not gonna be a place we wanna visit. It's gonna be a dump. Uh, and then the last photo, I was a little embarrassed at first because I had a great photo like this from our beach cleanup of Haley and I, and I lost it. Um, but it just struck me that that's a great picture because in the center um, on the left, that is, um, the owner of a Islands Grill and Cafe. She's a community leader and advocate and a business leader in the hospitality community. Next to her is Kim Marchand. She's the treasurer of Care for the Cape and Islands, a business leader, a CFO, uh, an owner of a, a co-work space, a mover and shaker. She also goes and monitors ponds, check for algae. She goes and does beach cleanups. She's actively engaged as a citizen scientist. So I think this really kind of shows the, the scope of the type of people that you can engage and get involved that can have an impact on this work. Uh, next slide. Roll through this real quick, but ultimately our goals, reduce marine debris, educate, provide uh, the capacity and the capability for industry to shift towards sustainable uh, practices. And, um, and yeah, so uh, we can skip to the next slide. One of our major focus is uh, engaging the municipalities as well as chambers as one, the business leaders for chambers, they connect us to their members and two, the municipalities, the regulatory uh, agencies, the health departments, the board of health. We've had some sweeping bans for plastic go through the Cape and Islands that quite frankly are draconian. They came from the citizens and didn't necessarily take into uh, account the businesses and constituents that are impacted. And now we are helping facilitate, not necessarily redrafting, but engaging constituents to get involved in this conversation, to develop regulations and policies that make sense, that fill the intent to reduce plastic, but also have the ability to be implemented. Because ultimately a business, if this is too hard, they're going to do the math and say, all right, I'll get fined, but I'm saving X money by, by not shifting to sustainable service where I'm going to do that. And, you know, we want to mitigate that barrier to success. We want to facilitate community and civic engagement. We play the role as the facilitator. We try to beat the bushes and get people energized and then provide them the resources to do the great work. Next slide. We focus on providing technical assistance and other community support resources, 
apples to apples, peer leaders communicating their stories and then providing the technical resources from the subject matter experts that help them make those shifts, make those changes. Uh, so Surfrider, we've heard about Surfrider several times today, amazing organization, Cayman Islands chapter, incredibly active, super excited that uh, the Northeast Regional Manager has joined our board of directors, so 100%. Uh, and then we actively work with our state level DEP, our, our county level DEP, and uh, with industry. Better Earth is a producer of compostable serviceware. We did a better meet and greet. We call them listening sessions to kind of engage more, say, hey, here's some information, but we want to hear what you have to say. Uh, next slide, please. One of the key focus of our, our work is expanding the Take Care Cape Cod message. If you think of Got Milk, I'm kind of dating myself, but if you remember the Got Milk PSA campaign, Got Milk, Take Care of Cape Cod. It's simple shifts in our behaviors that can provide us a sustainable future for our community. And rather than posters and just putting stuff out there that's ultimately more trash, we've worked with local artists. This is Sarah Thornton to develop permanent art structures. This is at the major visitor center along the major highway on the Cape and Islands that hundreds of thousands of visitors each year pass by. And in addition to this amazing sculpture that's marine debris, there's a sign with QR code that connects them with educational resources. But it's finding engaging, positive ways to communicate this message and the need versus um, kind of the doom and gloom. Skipping ahead. Next slide. Uh, Party with a Purpose, we provide uh, environmental and sustainable uh, consultation to event services. So, Provincetown Business Guild, Carnival, a huge tourism event, 150,000 people each year. We provided them support, reusable cups, water refill stations, as well as with farmers markets, so on and so forth. Next slide. Cape Cod Baseball League is a major cultural institution, um, a tourism uh, leader, and hundreds of thousands of residents and visitors alike attend these games. We partnered with them to implement recycling ambassadors and sustainable practices at their events. And literally hundreds of thousands of touch points with consumers and engages in those conversations like, oh, why are you doing that? Oh, this is why? Oh, this is easy recycling or this or that? Bring my water bottle? I didn't think of that. Next slide. And then lastly, what's next? Uh, we have our annual uh, advocacy summit. As you see, some familiar faces uh, will be speaking next week. So we're happy to see um, you know, Dr. Gola and, and Dr. Madison uh, providing some additional uh, content for our, our program, but really providing programming for a broad range of constituents so they come and they can leave with actionable items that can make a difference in our community. Um, last slide, the next slide, this is just you scan that, it's like a survey to like, oh, let's join the coalition. There's too much to it. We're at the point now where like business owner, you want to be part of the coalition, you're signed up. You know, like mitigate barriers to access engagement uh, versus, you know, it's principle and practice, especially when you're working with business, you want to meet them where they're at. Um, and then last slide, this is my contact information, but I want to stop or I want to finish with a shout out to uh, Plastic Free Cleveland and Leah and uh, Abigail. When we first started this work, we met them during one of our working group Zoom calls, and they've done this coalition work for many, many, many years. And we're like, hey, can you help us? Literally had a call with them. They're like, here's the playbook, um, anything you need. We had an AmeriCorps service member, their AmeriCorps service member, now their program coordinator, um, met with ours, and it was just indicative of the collaborative nature of this work, indicative of the intent from Noah C. Grant, and uh, I just want to really tip my hat to them because it was like we got this playbook. It was like major leagues giving it to like the JV high school team, but like we've took what we can implement, and now we have a plan to what we can grow forward. So um, awesome work to them. Now we have some time for questions. Great project, uh, Adam. Uh, I had a question. One of your slides had uh, like a banner for compost, like switching to compostable foodware. But is there a commercial composting facility close enough that um, those businesses can actually compost that? We so that is another um, advocacy push 
of this project to increase investments in infrastructure like industrial composting. Um, so short answer, no, but we have a regional provider that uh, we're helping make inroads into the community, whether it be you know waste diversion at the transfer stations or discounts for businesses that use sustainable service where they're like, all right, and that in turn helps them develop business, develop roots, which in turn consumer engages municipality, engages government and say, hey, we need this. We also have a, um, a large Air Force base that um, has plenty of space that we're working with uh, various levels of government to create that. Good morning, I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. I think the idea of selling the service where you work at an event and help them recycle and, and that stuff. I'm, I'd love to hear more about that, maybe just a little bit now and then I'll, I'll find you later. But I think it's a great idea. 100%. So ultimately, yeah, let's like, I come from a management uh, development background, you know, that's why it's great to have the environmentalists because they kind of keep me in check. But um, we love to monetize programming when we can. We're offering these services as collaborative as free resources at this point in time. But so say Carnival, they have a large scale parade that we set up water refill stations. We provided educational materials, reusable aluminum cups that you know we're like, oh, if you want to bring them back, that's great. We can repurpose them or keep them. Like, and they're like, oh, this is reusable. We didn't know. Um, same with the farmer's market. That farmer's market that we work with has a beer garden, has a brewery. We have a lot of brewers in our community. We go to them and say, hey, we can help you um, replace your, um, your plastic cups. And over the course of the season, we'll give you the logistical support to implement, and then we'll take it back. You know, we're looking at um, ice cream shops to be able to say, like, oh, we can't get rid of our spoons. We use so many spoons. All right, let's start a private program with one store to say, all right, we will provide you your inventory of reusable spoons for this season to then have that case study, to have that data then go, all right, moving forward, businesses, there's a value to this service and this is the value that we'd be charging you. Uh, but yeah, I love to chat more. It's a great kind of in and also um, consumer engagement. It gets them in a kind of social setting that they're a little bit more open to like conversation versus kind of, uh, you know, oh, you should do this, or you know, oh, behind a podium, educational, it's you know, having a more casual social setting. Okay, we have time for one more quick question, I think. So I was just wondering, you mentioned you had a meet and greet for businesses, and I'm wondering if you got, how did you get them to buy into that? Uh, they, with me, they're like, we don't have time for everything that anybody could ever bring up. 100%. Uh, first and foremost, we found um, business leaders that can advocate for that and provide space. You know, so it's like, hey, come to my restaurant, let's talk shop. Partnering with um, the chamber as an advocate for businesses, as well as the, um, the health departments, the recycling committees, engaging the municipalities, but really especially with the considering like plastic bans that are impending that are not implementable. Um, we've had the Board of Health and the health agents come to us and say, hey, can you help us out? The chambers, hey, we, we don't know what to do. Uh, so that's how we've done it. Also, it's meeting them when they can. If they say, hey, a three o'clock meeting, we're not gonna work. You know, show up at eight and I'm making the bagels. I show up at eight when they're making the bagels to have conversations. So we're always aware of speaking the language, meeting them where they're at and, and finding those peer leaders for them to relate to, to connect with, to advocate for our story and our mission. But it's not easy. Like I've, I've bought a lot of takeout to develop those relationships and develop my waistline. But now businesses, when I come in, they're not like, oh, what does this guy want? They're like, oh, hey, what are you, what are you picking up today? And then they step aside and we have a cup of coffee and we talk. It's really, not to oversimplify it, but it's shaking hands and kissing babies, you know, and, and that's really what it, boils down to that grassroots, beat in the street, canvassing kind of work. Um, especially for hospitality businesses, that's what works best. That's what I found at least. Thank you, Adam. That's all the time we have for questions.
All right, up next we have Distributed Mobile Upcycling by Patrick Simpson. Thank you. Um, in starting, I'd like to recognize our partners. Um, Ginny Eckert, Brooke Carney are with the Alaska Sea Grant. Ava Roloff with the Yakutat Tlingit Tribe in Yakutat, Alaska. Tracy Wyrek Cassidy with the Tech Chinook Watershed Council in Haines. The Haines Friends of Recycling, including Melissa Aronson and Kate Saunders. And then finally, uh, Camilo, who I'll talk about a bit uh, shortly, with Dave Riley, Anna Maria Cook, and Bill Roberson. And also, we've been funded through the Small Business Innovation Research Program by uh, EPA and USDA pretty significantly uh, with phase one and phase two programs from both of those agencies. Next slide, please. So uh, our goal is to, we've built a single system already that's road capable. And we wanted to be able to reach the communities in remote Alaska. And to do that, we realized that we needed to build a more modular approach. So what we've done is we've taken the approach that we did with our 53 foot system, which I'll show you shortly, and we put it into 20 foot containers. And this system goes into these communities and I'll show you in pictures, uh, takes stockpiled plastics and converts it into recycled plastic lumber that we call grizzly wood. So our goal is to build that second system, demonstrate it in uh, three communities, and then um, continue with our outreach and education process. Next slide, please. So here's the traditional solution that's used when you're doing mechanical recycling. It's called the hub and spoke model. And what you do is you, you bring all your material into a centralized hub facility and then you process it and then you send the product back out. Well, that works great if you've got rail and road, uh, which are very affordable ways to move material. But in Alaska, almost all of our material is moved by barge and by air, and it's very expensive. So we're prohibited by using that model. Next slide, please. So here's the Alaskan approach. This is what I've proposed um, and uh, we've demonstrated, and that is you can stockpile the plastic in the local community, bring the processing equipment to the community, process it there, convert it into something useful, sell it in that community, and then move to the next community. Next slide, please. This is where we're at currently. We've got uh, two 20-foot modules. One has a grinder in it, one has an extruder. The grinder module is just about complete. Uh, the extruder module is uh, underway. Uh, both those will be done and demonstrated in April. Next slide, please. This is what makes grizzly wood. We take um, plastic ocean waste. Currently, we're getting that from six different marine debris collection programs over five different communities. We add to that post-consumer and post-industrial waste. And the combination of those is brought together, melted, and converted into a recycled plastic lumber that we call grizzly wood. Next slide, please. So our demonstration programs have covered South Central and Southeast Alaska. Next slide. In uh, South Central, we've been in Palmer, Anchorage, Soldotna, and Seward, each of those for at least a month. Most of our operations are centralized in Palmer. Next slide, please. And this past September, we went to Haines, and then uh, next April, we'll be going to Yakutat. Next slide, please. So um, a big focus of what we're trying to accomplish is this doesn't work if we can't sell the end product. Sustainability is only accomplished if we can generate revenue. And so we're looking at every possible way in which we can generate revenue. The first, of course, is selling grizzly wood. Uh, the second one, which I'll talk to you about in a bit, is selling um, plastic credits. And so those are two that, that come out to us immediately. So our sales strategy has been to find those spots where grizzly wood has its, its most advantages, and that's where there's ground contact, uh, it doesn't absorb water. It's got a, a lot of those advantages that sometimes are disadvantages. And um, couple that with a strong outreach program. Next slide, please. These are some examples of our grizzly wood that we've made. Customers have bought and put into use. So these are decks that have been made with our grizzly wood. Next slide, please. Trail rehabilitation, as I mentioned on the previous slide, was a, a big uh, marketing effort on our part. And we've uh, have boardwalks and bridges now built with grizzly wood. Next slide, please. And uh, recreational furniture, and in particular park benches and picnic tables. Uh, those have been big sellers for us. And um, they continue to um, be things where we're getting a lot of order. Next slide, please. And then just simply dunnage, just holding things up. It, uh, it's, it's a good use of 
plastic waste. Um, that's a six by eight down there that's eight foot long, weighs 145 pounds, so it's not something you're usually going to toss around, but it'll be there for 35, 40, 50 years. Next slide, please. Our grizzly wood production, um, this is a, showing you just in process, um, but we have worked very hard to scale. And scaling means that you need to be able to track your product all the way from the point in which you get a, a quote, uh, when you bring material into your facility, all the way through the production process to the point in which you fill the quote, generate the sale, or take the sale and convert it into an invoice and deliver it. Um, in addition to that, there's a company called Camilo, and I've left some flyers out front. Camilo uh, provides a tracking system called Trustmark. And they've come up and they've worked with us to start tracking our plastic from origin all the way to the customer. And so this is um, a blockchain based system that um, allows the final customer to see the entire storyline of the plastic from the point in which it was captured until the point in which it was used. And then that creates a credit, just like carbon credits, that can be sold. And so we're looking forward to moving this project through that, app, that avenue of revenue generation as an additional revenue stream. Uh, some of the challenges you'll see with grizzly wood, um, it's color in, color out. And so a lot of times customers say, hey, can I have, and I'll say, mm, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, forms are sticky. If you're interested in that, I can talk to you about that. Um, moisture is everywhere. And you've got to have your material dry to work with, or you have to find a way to dry it. Next slide, please. Um, our sales in 2003 were just about 33,000. In 2004, we just hit 100, and I think we're going to be probably close to 150. So our goal was to triple our sales in a year. Uh, most of that is because of the hiring of the sales and marketing director. And they were half-time in Q1, and now they're full-time. Um, that's absolutely essential. That you have somebody focusing on delivering your message, meeting the customer, and, de and delivering the product. And then uh, that has resulted in 4,300 boards and 90,000 pounds of plastic that's been used. Next slide, please. <laughs> Done a lot of education and outreach, over 200 events. Um, we do approximately 1.3 articles a month and about one point, I'm sorry, 1 1.3 events a week and 1.5 articles per month. So next slide, please. In summary, we're on track. <clears throat> We've got uh, two of our three demonstrations completed. The third one will be done in April, which will complete our project. And um, we feel like uh, you know, being able to be a part of this community has been a very, very big help to us. Next slide, please. So as I'm fond of saying, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> It was a great, great, great presentation. Thank you so much. I so I saw your revenue for selling the grizzly wood. What's your uh, revenue in terms of the plastic credit that you mentioned? So the initial numbers that I've seen, they're not flattering. It's like two hundred dollars a ton is what I've seen. That's it's it's a, a fairly nascent marketplace. So you're talking ten cents a pound, um, but it's still you know ten cents a pound. So um, if if we sell it at two dollars a pound, and now I'm selling it at two dollars and ten cents a pound. And right now my margin is around 14 cents a pound, then I just doubled my margin nearly by adding plastic credits. So although it's not in a substantial amount, it makes it a big difference on the bottom line. Hi, thank you. That was a great presentation. I'm sorry if I didn't totally understand uh, your process all the way. So uh, you're actually going into these communities, they're bringing the plastic and then on site, you're using those containers to process it into that grizzly wood right there? That's correct. Okay, thank you. You might have already said this. Uh, are you limited in the types of plastic that you collect and process? I, I didn't say that, and that's that's always an issue with, especially when you do post consumer. Uh, we take ones, twos, and fives. The twos and fives make grizzly wood. We have another project right now where we're making grizzly bricks, which is a new product, and that we use the number ones.
they got your question. Does anyone else have any more questions for Patrick? Here. Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, wonderful work. I'm so inspired by what you're doing. Um, it sounds like you're focusing right in in-state local markets, um, but as you continue to think more broadly, um, you know, we've done a lot of work, me and Sea Grant, with helping our seafood economy do a better job of telling their story. And the market data does support, right, that consumers will pay a, a bigger price for knowing every single bingo thing about that product. And, um, you know, we'd love to connect with you on some of those storytelling exercises because my sense is that what you're doing here may inspire and attract people outside of the state to, you know, buy your product and want to invest in what you're doing. Yeah. And have you considered that, I guess? Yeah, it's certainly our hope. We, we picked a name that's Alaskan, uh, yeah. Grizzly Wood. Now, I mean, that doesn't necessarily say much, but it's very easy to remember. Um, it's why eBay's eBay and not you know, auction web. You know, no one remembered auction web. Everybody remembered eBay. Um, Grizzly Wood is just very memorable, so we hope that excuse me, <clears throat> that could be an eventuality. But I'll say this, sales and marketing is a local opportunity. I mean, you, you really have to build in your sales and, and all the things you've been hearing about in terms of relationship building is the same thing for sales. Um, I do rotaries, I do presentations to schools, I, I do every event fair I can. And every one of those might generate one sale and that's the next sale and the next sale and get a fall on sale. We have taken plastic from the um, from Hillcorp and ConocoPhillips, the two large oil companies on the north slope of Alaska. We did been doing that um, quite a while, and now they're buying plastic from us. And so earlier on in this, there was a question: Well, how do you engage the industry? Well, I think you start with finding ways in which you can help solve their problem, and then once you solve their problem and you develop some trust, then you can move toward them solving your problem, which is I need revenue. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right. Next, we have from blue gray to blue green facilitating the transition to non-plastic natural material use within the coastal zone economy. It's presented by Mar uh, Mariah Livernoy. Hi everyone, um, I am excited to be here and to share with you all some exciting updates. Um, we were funded through the first round, so we've been working on this for over a year now. Um, so over, especially over this past summer, we've got some really exciting research updates um, and some fantastic outreach and engagement that's been going on. Next slide. So um, the, the impetus for this project kind of came from the idea of paradoxical uses of plastic um, in the coastal zone. So um, a couple of good examples of this are plastic silt fencing. Um, so silt fences, if you're driving down the highway or past a construction site, you'll see this stuff everywhere. Um, it's meant to protect our water bodies from silt that is running off um, from areas that are devoid of um, grass and plants and things like that. Um, this also shows up in um, habitat restoration, so in oyster reef restoration. Um, some really amazing work has been done um, bagging loose shell that provides substrate for oysters to settle on and then form new reefs and repopulate um, degraded areas. But a lot of the times in the past we've been using plastic uh, mesh bags to do this. So in a way, you know, we're trying to help. We're trying to help the environment in some way but we are also probably harming it in other ways where we're producing you know, macroplastics, microplastics, things like that. Next slide. So our project is looking into sort of just finding, identifying and testing the viability of um, non-plastic alternatives uh, wherever possible. Next slide. So I'm gonna focus on, you can press next again. Um, I'm gonna focus on three of our six sort of focus areas. Um, so floating treatment wetlands, erosion control geotextiles, and oyster shell bags. Next. I have a lot to get through, so I'm gonna to try to go quickly. Um, so I'll give you some um, highlights from research progress uh, over the last year. Next. So one of the really big uh, projects that we focus a lot of our efforts on, at least I'm at the University of South Carolina, we have lots of partners doing other stuff elsewhere. Um, but one thing that we really focused on this summer was 
testing the degradation of natural fiber geotextiles um, that are primarily made for erosion control um, and silt fencing. Um, so like that first photo that I showed you. Um, we found a bunch of different materials. There's tons of this stuff out there um, that is being marketed as you know, a natural alternative to these plastic products. Um, so we identified you know, vendors and um, manufacturers. Um, a lot of it was coconut coir, um, natural fiber um, geotextile, uh, primarily made in um, Sri Lanka and India. Um, and then jute products. There's a little bit less of that around, but we did find some materials um, in that category. And so we're basically testing, you know, the degradation of these things out in natural environments um, and then kind of comparing them to their plastic analogs. So on the bottom there, we have um, the shell bags that people use for oyster refrustoration and silt fencing. Next. So um, we went about this by conducting a field experiment um, to test degradation rates um, in uh, estuarine conditions, so inter intertidal conditions in um, an estuary in South Carolina. Um, and what we did was we cut out little swatches of each of these materials, we affixed them onto panels, and then we deployed those panels out into the intertidal in the salt marsh um, in coastal South Carolina. Next. And so um, what we're doing is uh, every about two weeks to a month, we are going out and collecting samples from those panels. And we are shipping those samples to our partners at the University of Dayton, who are um, material scientists and mechanical engineers who are actually physically testing um, like tensile strength and toughness, some, some actual you know, quantitative properties of these materials as they degrade over time. You can click next. Um, and so basically, this is going to give us kind of a sense for how long we can expect um, these materials to last out in the environment. Um, so especially for like the oyster shell bags, you know, we really only need them to last as long as it takes for oysters to settle and start to kind of congeal <laughs> into, into a reef, um, and then they can degrade all they want. So um, we'll be getting some really good quantitative data. Uh, <clears throat> next. Another thing, staying in the theme of oysters, um, I'm an ecologist that was hired on to do this debris work, um, and I'm slowly but surely making it an, an oyster project. Um, but so we've been working with uh, partners at the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, their shellfish management sector. Um, we met with some of them and, and they had a ton of ideas of you know, different ways to restore um, oysters in, in South Carolina. So one of those things that they brought up to us um, was that they have approved wooden stakes. So these are like pine survey stakes or like tomato stakes or even bamboo um, that they allow commercial harvesters in South Carolina to use as an alternative to shell culch for replanting purposes. Um, after they harvest oysters, they have to replant. They're allowed to use these wood stakes because, as you can see in that photo, um, oysters settle on them like crazy and they grow um, and they do seem to be like pretty efficient and, and um, worthwhile to do. Um, they're very cheap and easy. You can also, we get ours from um, tomato growers that will just get, they're gonna burn them. So they give them to us for free. Um, so I'm working with uh, a master's student at the College of Charleston named Lexi Watson. We uh, did some preliminary field work this summer at a site um, where these wood stakes were deployed uh, for a couple of years. And basically all you need to take from this is that the wood stakes with the star there have really, really high densities of oysters, even more so than the really healthy natural reef nearby um, and a sort of similar um, uh, size distribution. So they are working pretty well. Um, so we're gonna continue down this path. Next slide. Um, so PhD student um, Briar Omi Connolly in that photo there, she's working with um, my colleague Bill Stroh Snyder at USC. Um, they're going to be, you know, designing an experiment to start this spring, where we're basically testing, thank you, um, testing the uh, effects of different wood types and staking density on how well this stuff works. Um, one other thing that we're working on um, with our partners at Clemson, this is Dr. Sarah White and her student uh, Camila Montoya is biodegradable floating treatment wetlands. Um, so if you don't know what a floating treatment wetland is, like I didn't um, when I started this, um, people put them out in um, like stormwater ponds, golf course ponds, they help um, take up nutrients and um, reduce you know, pollution and, and whatnot um, in these man-made ponds. And so basically what um, Camilla saw was that she was using these biodegradable materials to make them help them float. And you know, she saw some good, some good growth, but um, they were degrading really rapidly. So she very cleverly came up with um, the Aero floating treatment wetlands using um, these glass aggregates and metal mesh to, uh, thanks, to uh, get these things to float. So progress is being made there, ongoing. Next. 
Um, and then I also wanted to talk a little bit about our outreach and engagement highlights. Um, so Brooke and Matt are here from South Carolina Sea Grants Consortium. They might have uh, a better sense of some of this stuff, but I wanted to at least bring it up um, very quickly. So next. Um, all of that research that I was just talking about, everything that we've done has been guided by an advisory committee um, that South Carolina Sea Grant and us um, and all of our partners met with um, back in October of last year, where we helped um, you know, sort of facilitate conversations for identifying candidate materials for replacement you know, with the people who are actually potentially going to be using these products. And we have another one of those um, in January 2025 uh, upcoming. And then um, folks at Sea Grant um, also hosted a marine debris educator workshop where they brought together um, formal and informal educators from across South Carolina um, and they are working on co-producing a teacher toolkit focused on marine debris. Um, so if you have questions about that, definitely get in touch with Brooke uh, over, over yonder um, because I was not there. But um, really awesome stuff going on. Um, so thank you to them. Next. I, that's we're it. Out of time. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> I will say um, our, all of our partners are listed on the bottom there. So thank you to that. Hi, I enjoyed your talk. I'm going to be talking about oysters too, so we should connect. Yes. Um, I had a question about the, the wooden stakes. Do you have, a, do, the folks who are using those, the farmers, are they having any issues with like um, shipworm or anything that burrows? And yes, are they, you know, are they time limited how long they can be out there? So yes, um, it kind of depends. It seems to depend on um, inundation timing. So if they're too far out um, towards the creek and they're inundated pretty frequently, then yeah, shipworms are a problem. Um, but they'll just sort of fall over. Um, oftentimes it seems like it, it, it's enough time for there to be settlement and growth and then the wood stakes will fall over. And then it's almost like creating a little reef um, with the stakes that have kind of fallen and inter interlinked with each other. But that's one of the things we're working on um, with this new experiment that we're doing, where we're gonna be doing a bunch of staking and trying to figure out best practices. Yeah. Really cool project, thank you. Yes. Um, a question, uh, are you working with commercial oyster growers with the reef bags or with the oyster reef bags? And if so, how receptive have they been to using the car? Because this, this, we have this issue on the West Coast that there's a lot of um, commercial oyster growers and they all use that black mesh. Um, so I'm wondering if you've had any interaction with the growers and their, their perception and attitude about this alternative. Yeah, um, so most of what we've been doing is um, commercial harvesters who they're basically South Carolina leases out land where you can harvest a certain you know, number of oysters um, and then you have to replant um, to like you know, keep it rolling. Um, so a lot of the times they'll use shell, whatever. They don't do bag shell, it's loose shell. Um, so any of the bag shell type of work would be done with like the, um, there's like an outreach and engagement arm of um, South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. Um, so yeah, we have not really worked with them very much. They've got a lot of stuff going on, so we haven't really talked to them. There's also, there are some, it's a very small industry, but there are some um, oyster aquaculturists uh, around the Charleston area um, that we haven't had a lot of success with just like the interaction yet, but um, yeah, definitely on the radar. Okay, we have time for one more question. Wonderful work. I'm so inspired by all you're doing. Um, quick question. Have you heard of Viable Gear? It's based out of Portland, Maine. They're working on, uh, you know, viable gear that's made out of seaweed and other things for the aquaculture industry. So maybe I can help make a connection. Maybe you can test some of their products. Also, what is jute? I'm not familiar with what that. It's uh, if you get something that's made of like burlap. Oftentimes that's jute, although burlap I have found is a really vague term that doesn't actually mean anything, but it's, it's often okay. jute. Um, it's just a, it's a different plant um, that they make huh. fiber material out of. And what about hemp? Have you ever thought about hemp? <gasps> well, we're in South Carolina and um, hemp <laughs> is kind of a touchy subject um, in conservative states, I found. Um, so yeah, we there are some hemp growers um, in South Carolina that we've kind of tried to, to interact with, but um, the other problem is that a lot of the hemp is made like for clothing. Um, that, that's kind of the, the um, woven material that ends up 
being produced with hemp a lot of the time, um, which isn't particularly useful for a lot of our use cases. It's, it's not as tough as it would need to be. Oh, interesting. But, okay, yeah, thank you. We'll move on to our next presenter now, thank you. Okay, up next we have reducing marine debris at the source, material replacement and source reduction for single use food packaging. It's presented by Harsha Elizabeth James and Colleen Walker. Hello everyone, I am Harsha Elizabeth James. I am representing Maine Sea Grant and the University of Maine's uh, Marine Debris Challenge Competition funded by NOAA. And uh, our project's name is Reducing Marine Debris at the Source, uh, Material Replacement and Source Reduction for Single-Use Food Packaging. Can you move to the next slide? Um, first, I want to give you a background about our project. So ours is an interdisciplinary team. And when it comes to our advisory board, it becomes a transdisciplinary team. So we have uh, researchers, faculty, and students from the Chemical and Biomedical Engineering Department and Process Development Center. The director of the Process Development Center at UMaine, uh, Dr. Colleen Walker, is here with us. And we have also people from Anthropology and Climate Change Institute and our uh, main Grant program. Uh, so we have an interdisciplinary team. And we also have stakeholder engagement, which is a very important part of our uh, project. Uh, so we have an advisory board, which include members from culinary industry, from restaurant industry, from different businesses, aquaculture industry, etc., who actually provide us input and feedback with, uh, at every stage of our project so that we don't actually give them a plastic alternative uh, at the very end and then ask them to surprisingly use it uh, on a practical level. So uh, we have uh, four different tracks. Uh, the first one to three tracks is actually uh, focused on material replacement. So we are trying to replace the plastic with uh, sustainable materials from ocean and forest. And uh, the track four is uh, where we actually work with the restaurants and the business owners on understanding what are the uh, applicable uh, reuse systems that we can actually practically implement uh, at the business and restaurant level. And uh, then it comes uh, the team science coordination and synergies where I come in. So I had a hidden agenda when I included this to say that I'm not an engineer at all. I just know the spelling of engineering. Uh, so if any chemical engineers are here, please feel free to judge me when I go through all the engineering aspects of our project. Um, yeah, that's it. Can you please move to the next slide, please? So our first uh, research area is focusing on non-plastic food packaging and film materials. And uh, what we're trying to do is actually uh, evaluate the performance of uh, these commercial battery coatings on CNF uh, coated paper, which is cellulose nanofibers. And also we are evaluating alternatives to plastic films, uh, like using seaweed as an alternative for plastic films. So we have been developing a novel vacuum coating method to actually apply this highly uh, refined cellulose onto paper at high speed. And also we have been uh, developing some seaweed based uh, films uh, instead of the plastic materials. Can you please move to the next slide, please? So here goes, yes. So this is a novel vacuum method that we are actually using. So as you can see, when we apply the vacuum, we are actually successfully able to remove the water layer, which is good for our packaging. That's all I can do about this. Next slide, please. <laughs> So we are actually trying to improve the quality of the walking coating method and also improve the battery properties of the films that we are actually making from uh, seaweed, like improve the water and water vapor battery properties, etc. And this, my engineering friends told that it is a cross-section of seaweed-based film. I believe it, and I think you should too. Yes. <laughs> Next slide, please. So the next thing that we are working on is the thermally insulating packaging materials. As we know, uh, in previous presentations, we have seen that styrofoam is a very um, important problem when it comes to mass and volume, uh, the waste we are collecting. So our uh, research area two members are actually working on this to find a replacement for styrofoam. So uh, in 2011, one group had developed a gold roll uh, using a lobster shell and edible binder. It had a very uh, good impact resistance. Also, it degraded in the ocean within two weeks. Can you please move to the next slide, please? 
So we have actually successfully developed a process to reproduce this raw material and actually produce, uh, you know, coolers, etc., which are actually made from styrofoams. We have successfully done that, and this formed composite actually have a um, impact strength uh, greater than the styrofoam, and also a thermal transmission of the material is within the range of the styrofoam. And now we are actually working on optimizing density of the material and also performing standardized measurements of flame retardancy and also making sure that this definitely degrade uh, in water and ocean, etc. cetera. Uh, next slide, please. And the research uh, track three, they are actually uh, working on synthesis of chitin derivatives, that is chitin and chitin nanocrystals, chitosan and chitin nanocrystals from prestigious shells. And also we are all, uh, developing a barrier using soya bean wax so that we can uh, replace the plastic materials with that. Can you move to the next slide, please? Here goes another picture. So as you can see here, in A and B, um, the water contact angle is actually less than 90 degree, which means that it's hydrophilic. That means it attracts water, which is not very good for our packaging. And as you can see in B and D, where we are actually wax coating on a paperboard and CNF based paper, the water contact actually is, angle is actually greater than 90 degree, which is hydrophobic, so that's good. And our recently, um, uh, our student uh, is working on the application of chitin nanocrystals and nanocellulose as a bio-renewable polymer for food packaging industry. So we are also exploring the antibacterial properties that this can actually give to our plastic film, uh, sorry, alternative plastic film. Uh, next uh, slide, please. And our final track is the research uh, track four, which actually works on the reuse systems. So what we are trying to understand is what are the barriers when it comes to actually this reusable packaging systems, practical application at the business and restaurant level. So we actually do focus groups, we do interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews, we do uh, a lot of stakeholder engagement to understand what are the barriers and what are the attributes that they are looking for when it comes to reusable systems. And um, uh, we are actually, uh, planning many ground level pilot programs with including undergraduate students at community level so that we can actually pilot them and see what is working, what's not working and actually uh, make a reuse system that uh, people can actually apply at, uh, on their day to day basis. Uh, next slide, please. That's it. Next slide. I have one more slide. So these are our team members. We can literally fill up this whole auditorium if you want to. I have not included our advisory board members. Uh, we have around 14 advi advisory board members who actually help us in stakeholder engagement and input and feedback at every stage of our research. Yes. Now, if you have any chemistry level questions, please feel free to ask me. <laughs> Do we have any questions? I have a question for you. So what is your favorite part about working on this project so far? And is there anything coming up that you're excited about? Uh, so I actually coordinate all these members, basically from the Anthropology and Climate Institute, the engineering people, and also other stakeholder members. So the interesting part of, uh, for me, uh, that is exciting for me, is to listen to all these engineers talk about things that I really don't know. Uh, and uh, I love that I learn a lot from all these things. Uh, and uh, we do have our advisory committee meeting coming up uh, this uh, uh, winter, November 22nd, I believe. So we will be actually discussing with them regarding uh, what progress we have made so far and also get input on how to go forward with each track. And uh, um, that is one thing exciting. And then definitely, I, as I told, we, have, we had our spring workshop on May 30th this year. And our next one will be coming next spring. So we are excited to plan that as well based on the input and feedback we got from the last spring workshop. Yes. It's really exciting. We have a question over here. It seems like you had um, many different graduate students in a variety of different fields. And I'm curious as to how, go, how you went about recruiting them, whether they were recruited through the main project or whether they're the individual um, faculty members recruited their own or, and whether they intersect with one another or have met one another or, or what that might look like. Thank you for the question. So um, 
uh, we have four research tracks and we have uh, faculty members also who are guiding the students in each track. So when it comes to the recruitment, it was each faculty member who did the interview and all the process to actually recruit students who catered to their particular research track. Uh, uh, and then when it comes to meeting, yes, that is what I do. I make sure that we have monthly uh, Marina Biz meeting where everybody come together and actually share the details and updates of their uh, work and interact with each other and also share in some engineering tracks uh, they do know what they're talking not like me so they do actually help each other out when it comes to some uh, roadblock when it comes to their uh, research etc and um, i did actually force them to come together in person last uh, month so that we can come together and see literally each other face to face so yes we do that a lot and thank you for the question anybody have any other question if you have any chemistry level questions, you do have our Dr. Walker here to answer you. If I scared you by telling that I don't know chemistry. Yeah. Hi, thank you. A great presentation. I was curious, and I apologize if I, I missed this somewhere, but um, where is the chitin or the shells that you're using coming from? Uh, I don't know the exact source. If Dr. Walker can answer from where they're actually sourcing them. Yeah, from from a man, they're from a lobster manufacturing plant. So they're commercial sourced. Yes, we see a question in the back. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned, so when you're looking at the biodegradable, like the cooler and the foam, um, are you also considering the chemicals and the dyes and the additives you're using? So as that's breaking down, um, you're not also in unintentionally introducing harmful chemicals into the environment? Thank you. That's a very good question, Dr. Walker. <clears throat> Thanks for that question. It's a great question. The the cooler that we showed is just made with the, the lobster chitin shell and a biological component, and that is it. So there's nothing, everything is food-based in that material. We have time for one more quick question. Yeah, so I guess this might be for both of you, more so you, um, but when you're testing for biodegradability, you know, there are always the ASTM standards that people look at. And so I was wondering what kind of field testing you guys do and how you kind of test the like very diverse environmental variables where um, materials can end up. Again, a, a great question because I understand the issues around biodegradability, compostability, but for most of these projects, we're not at that point yet, but um, Arsha did show the lobster um, ball and you saw the golf ball, great for cruise ships because it was just made from lobster shells, um, but they did uh, actual studies where they put that in ocean water and let it sit and degrade over time. But most of the projects, we haven't gotten to that point where we would test biodegradability or compostability. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. That was a very good question because that was one of the factors that came up during our stakeholder discussion because they were concerned about whether they will definitely degrade in the ocean or not. So we definitely are considering that. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next presenter. Thanks to all of our presenters. We're moving on to a new session. Um, this session is called Community-Based Solutions to Marine Debris Challenges. And our first project is Advancing Equitable Resources to Marine Debris Solutions through California's Ocean Litter Strategy, presented by Tanya Torres and Sydney Rillam. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tanya Torres and I'm the Marine Debris Research Associate with California Sea Grant. And this is, hi everyone, my name is Sydney Rillam and I'm a Marine Debris Specialist with the University of Southern California Sea Grant. And we both represent the two Sea Grant programs in California. Uh, we have a joint project um, that was awarded the first round of the coalition funding. So next slide. 
Uh, this is our wonderful project team that we don't have enough time to share um, and introduce all of them to you, but they are instrumental in the success of this project. So just wanna shout them out. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the Ocean Litter Strategy is California's version of the uh, Regional Marine Debris Action Plan, jointly developed by the NOAA Marine Debris Program and our state partner, the Ocean Protection Council. It was developed uh, back in 2018. It's a six-year plan. Uh, about 50 different organizations in California came together, drafted 64 actions um, spanning these six goals you see here, and um, all um, uh, outlining priorities that stakeholders can take to reduce and prevent ocean litter in California. Um, implementation of this plan relied heavily on volunteer leadership from these organizations, and though um, engagement was extremely high within the community, um, next slide please, there was um, a need to um, have this be a, a more inclusive coalition, uh, mostly because uh, we know that historically underserved and low-income neighborhoods are experiencing disproportionate negative effects of plastic pollution throughout its life cycle, or life cycle. and um, organizations that are serving these areas and groups such as environmental justice groups, community-based organizations, and California tribes um, weren't having a high representation in um, the conversations and engagement um, opportunities of the ocean litter strategy. And so in general, there is um, an incredible need and an opportunity to bring these voices and perspectives um, into the marine debris and conservation space, and um, this plan is no different. So next slide. Um, also, uh, back in 2022, the Ocean Litter Strategy Planning Team conducted its own SWOT analysis to identify its strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And um, so weaknesses that were highlighted were um, missing sectors, um, community-based organizations were called out, and then um, also the limited funding capacity and organizational capacity being a barrier to engagement. Um, not surprising, but um, there are no uh, funds associated with these plans. Um, and then an opportunity that was highlighted um, is that there is an opportunity to engage um, and have more justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility within the strategy. So knowing all of this background, um, when we received the funding for the um, BIL Coalition grant, we wanted to try to address these issues as best we could. Next slide. So our project has two objectives. The first one is to identify and engage the missing local perspective. Uh, perspectives and sectors in order to strengthen the ocean litter strategy framework and coalition. And uh, we did this by first conducting a statewide stakeholder gap analysis of this, the ocean litter strategy community. Um, and then we are currently in the process of running our pilot community needs assessment uh, in the Los Angeles area um, stemming from that gap analysis. And then our second objective uh, is to inform more coordinated investments into community-based marine debris solutions. And we are aiming to do this by trying to increase access to existing funding opportunities and explore um, equitable funding pra best practices uh, that we can share within our funding network. Um, so I'll pass it to Sydney to explain our progress on objective one so far. Thanks, Tanya. So next slide, please. Um, so these are some of the results from our gap analysis, looking at the different organizations and groups that have been involved with Ocean Layer Strategy since it started up. So, so far we've had 331 organizations engage with or participate in some sort, so for attending meetings, webinars, or work groups. Um, and of those, we've had 40% engage more than one instance. Um, as you can see on the map, naturally we've had the greatest um, number of engagement from the largest cities in California, so including San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, and Sacramento. Next slide, please. We also looked at the different types of organizations that we've engaged with. So this graph shows a number of organizations by various type or sector. So the top three bars display that nonprofits, uh, government, so government agencies, federal, state, or local, as well as industries have had the highest level of engagement. However, within that high, um, within that nonprofit bar, you can see that there's a small section of participation from environmental justice and place-based groups. Um, so that's something that we wanted to grow that participation in the future. And we also see very low tribal representation. Um, so while we're recruiting our community advisory group, we wanted to make sure that we're targeting these groups to um, make sure that their perspectives are heard and incorporated into the strategy. Next slide, please. So this is our community advisory group that we recruited and convened earlier this year. Um, it's made up of six different individuals that can speak to those missing perspectives that we've mentioned. So for instance, we have someone who can speak about tribal perspectives, equity, 
environmental justice, community-based and place-based environmental groups, as well as local city government. So it's quite a unique group that we have here um, that's been able to provide feedback and input on the strategy. Next slide, please. So one of the goals of this community advisory group is to help inform a Los Angeles community needs assessment. And we've been able to gather this information in a variety of forms, a format such as surveys or interviews, focus groups, both virtual and in person, um, in, a, in order to cater to the needs of each individual community group uh, or the group organization that they are representing. Um, so yeah, we've been able to gather information about priority trash pollutions, any barriers, and how this ocean layer strategy can help assist them in any, any way, shape, or form. And I'll pass it back to Tanya to talk about objective two. Next slide. Um, so for objective two, <clears throat> to try and address those uh, financial burden concerns, uh, we are developing a couple tools and resources for both applicants and funders. Um, so uh, for example, um, trying to put together a funding opportunities repository that will consolidate any existing available funding opportunities that align with the priorities of the ocean water strategy. And it will um, outline the solicitation details in a, in a simplified way um, so that uh, applicants can look through and, and, and find the best um, opportunity that fits their needs the best, whether that be by the priority, the funding source, um, eligibility, um, application requirements, um, maybe if there's technical assistance provided or not. Um, and then additionally, uh, we are working with our community advisory group to investigate the barriers and opportunities to more equitable funding. Um, and so we are trying to put together um, uh, best practices so that these funding opportunities can align better with the needs of the communities that we're trying to better more, more readily support. Um, and so we hope to share those best practices with the, the funders in our network. Next slide. And then um, th these are these objectives are still ongoing, so we haven't completed them yet. And so what we hope to get by the end of this project is um, a stronger ocean layer strategy coalition, obviously, um, where we have more meaningful engagement from these under historically underrepresented groups. Next. Um, hopefully to have, um, since the six-year plan ended this year, we're, we're evaluating and um, creating the next one. So hopefully having a more effective next version, a more inclusive next version of the ocean water strategy. Next. Um, obviously to uh, inform future funding priorities, to be more aligned with the needs of our th these types of communities. Next slide. And then um, hopefully to increase the connections between trash solutions, communities, and um, sources of support. And, and when we were doing that is to try through the uh, funding repository. Next slide. And then um, additionally, we, we see that this potentially this project could be a, used as a framework for other regions who are interested in, or having similar issues. Um, next slide. That's it for us. Thank you. We'll now take questions from the audience. And if our online listeners have any questions, you can put them in the chat as well. Right, I have a question for you. So what has been your favorite community outreach event that you've done for the project so far? So um, we're not really doing a bit large events. Um, with our advisory group, they're, they're more one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, occasions where we are, are learning from them. And I think my favorite part is that we took a very unique approach to it. So instead of just doing one survey for everyone or getting them together and doing one big focus group, we've asked them, with, within their communities, with who they represent, what is the most effective way to get get this information from them? And they've all chosen a different way. <laughs> so, like uh, Sydney mentioned, someone wanted to do just an interview. Someone wanted to go out and interview their community. Someone wanted to have a virtual focus group. Someone else wanted to do. I want to. I want an online survey. Someone. I don't want a survey. I just want to write it down on a Word doc. You know. So, I think being flexible has been a really cool experience to see how uh, receptive they are to that. Yeah, that's great. Um, it's great work. Um, I had a question about the tribal engagement. What have you found from your survey um, in being reported to you as um, effective ways to better engage tribal partners in California? <clears throat> Um, so we were lucky that um, USC Sea Grant has a, a existing relationship with a um, tribal organization that does a lot of um, tribal relations, and so we already had an existing relationship. Um, but something that um, in engaging with that uh, advisory member, something that like I didn't realize that 
I think in this age of coming out of uh, the virtual COVID world, wanting to get back to in-person things, she was actually reluctant. She's like, I love that it's everything's virtual. It's actually way more accessible to me. <laughs> and so, and she's like, tribal members are doing a lot. And, and she was one of the ones that I don't have time to go and ask all of my tribal um, other members. I will just give you my perspective and, you know. So um, just being, I think again, flexible and meeting them where they're at has been um, the best way forward. Time for one more question. In the back. Um, in reaching out to all of these different groups, has it has everyone one been kind of excited to talk with you, or has there been, especially from the, the traditionally underserved groups, skepticism or or resistance to providing feedback and, and making those connections? That's a great question. Um actually, yes, everyone has been really excited to work with us, um, which I may be cynical mind of mine thought, didn't know if that was going to be the case. Um, I will say though, it took a long time to actually get those six people together. Um, we the, the proposal had a lot more entailed in our project that we have, have to pivot now because of how long it took to actually contact these people, get them on board um, and together. So it, it is, you know, building those, you know, it, it was cold emails, it was cold calls, it was it was actually really difficult. But once you got their attention and you explained the project and showed, I don't know, that we cared and really wanted to learn from them, they were extremely excited to work with us. But initially it took a lot, it took a lot of time. And just to add something on to that, something we also learned, if, you know, a lot of these groups are short staffed, they don't have a ton of resources. So just being mindful of their time and also compensating for compensating them for that time is really important, especially from tribal groups who, you know, tend to give a lot of their time but not getting any, get anything back in return. So just, you know, part of working together and just being mindful of how they're helping you and want to help them back sort of thing. Thank you. That's all the time we have for questions. All right, our next presenter uh, will be presenting on two projects. The first one is Consider Litter, Data-Driven Community-Centered Marine Debris Prevention and Mitigation. And uh, coming up to the stage is Julie Falco. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm Julie Falgo. I'm the Seafood Industry Liaison for um, Louisiana Sea Grant. And I'm actually here presenting on behalf of one of my colleagues, Vanessa Van Deren. She's at a mandatory meeting with the rest of my colleagues in Louisiana. So this first one I'm presenting on is Consider Litter. And like uh, it says, it's a data-driven project uh, through high schools to bring awareness to litter and um, the different aspects it takes. You can go to the next slide. So with this, this is a local-based um, project, working with uh, local schools and getting them involved, um, not just the students, but the teachers. We actually train the teachers and bring everything in that they need. They do a litter cleanup once a month. And what they do is they qualify and quantify everything that they pick up. And so uh, what it does, it, it brings awareness to this local problem that we have. Next slide. And part of this problem is, this, uh, this always amazes me, we drain in Louisiana through the Mississippi River 43% of the nation and two provinces in Canada. And so it's not just water, it's also pollutants, garbage, different things. And this really, really showed up in 2019, we had a major flooding uh, disaster. Um, from the Mississippi River and when the waters receded and people were doing cleanups, they were finding bottles and cans, um, all kinds of brands that they had never heard of because they were from up north. We are, this also contributes to our large uh, dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So everything just kind of comes to us. So next slide. 
So the main thing of this project is implementing monthly cleanups of campuses where the students are, is a student driven litter cleanup overlooked by their teachers and stuff. They do data collection analysis, and then they all of this stuff they take together and put it into um, a database um, program where they can go back and look at what they're cleaning up, how much, what days, different times of the year, are they seeing certain things compared to other times of the year. Next slide. So this is fourth through 12 graders and then teachers in, in science, math, social studies, and other um, subjects. We start with the Teacher Professional Development Day, then we have monthly cleanups and data collection, and then the teachers enter the data on the platform, and the students and the teachers create a plan for how can we reduce litter in our school. And this is one of the pictures of um, them just bringing the data in, the litter in, and then starting to sort it out by type and weight. Next slide. So they use the EPA escape trash assessment protocol um, that gives them all the guidelines that they need of what we're looking for in this data collection. And it helps them with site selection, it helps them characterize the cleanup, and it helps them with data entry and analysis. Um, what they do from there is, part of this is it's building it into the class schedules, making it part of the curriculum. That way they're not taking time away from the school and it uh, it's a, turns into a school-wide uh, activity. Next slide. So what they do, there's this interactive mapping where um, they come in and so they have all the tarps out and they start separating all the trash they collect on that day by, you know, plastic, styrofoam, material, whatever it is, and however many different categories they have. And then it's all weighed and then they characterize it and they go into this data set and give it characterizations and stuff. Uh, and so they're able to go in afterwards and they even other schools that are in the program can go in and, and compare themselves to other schools or they can compare themselves to um, each class. And so it, it provides a data collection and storage for the teachers, but and it, you can find it on this website, FieldScope. Ours is considerlitterfieldscope.org. And the kids are really getting into it. So next slide. So this is the, um, after they've done all of their analysis, this is the page the teacher uses to go and input everything into to the system. On the right is a map. And so the bigger your orange dot gets, that's the more data you have put in. So the more cleanups you have, the bigger your, your dot should get. And then down here, they can go in and the students can out actually go in and do graphs and charts and, and different things for their science reports and, and other things that they want to do with this. Next slide. And then it's broken down into like up here, um, how many, you know, items were in good condition, how many were degraded, okay, cigarettes, automotive, other. So they break it down into all these different categories to see what, what they're seeing. And then it all goes back to looking at the watershed and where some of this stuff may come from and make them more aware of the environment around them. Next slide. And so it, incre you know, it helps increase the students and, um, and their teachers' knowledge and awareness of litter, but also for them to want to have stewardship over their campus and decrease litter over time and understanding the role that they play and our Mississippi Atchafalaya system plays. But uh, one of the things that um, uh, Vanessa gets more is how did this get here? And why does this blow away? Because when they're doing these cleanups, um, they're sorting everything out and they're going, we well, just cleaned that up last month. Why are we getting this again? And then on the other side, you know, you might have these light, little light pieces of plastic. They blow it away while they're trying to pick things up and they're going, having to go chase them. So they're seeing, you know, how the environment works. And one school uh, was really cool with them. They kept seeing these um, clear plastic straw wrappers every cleanup and they're going what is going on but well, they realize their cafeteria was using plastic strokes with clear plastic straw wrappers and that's why they kept getting this so they asked the cafeteria to please use paper straws with no wrappers and that they're not cleaning up those little plastic things so that was a good little outcome next slide so this is just the numbers 50 1900 students um 12 schools 48 teachers next slide and uh, by the end of this next year, we'll have 15 schools and 3,900 pieces of liver, over 170 pounds. Next slide. 
And it just reiterates back to where we came from, where this is, is coming from. But if we don't do our part at the bottom of the beat boot to clean things up, whatever we have is going to go into the ocean. And so it's just keeping them doing that. And next slide. And that's it. And I can try to answer any questions you may have. Um, I didn't work on the project, but I'm familiar with the project. And if I can't answer it, we'll get it from Vanessa. Do you know if the students, are they doing any lessons plans related to the litter as well, or is it just they're doing the cleanups? Um, we're developing the lesson plans for the, for the students um, and for the teachers so that this can continue. One of the things that we hope to have that happen with this is that the school eventually takes it on where we don't have to um, constantly be going there. That's one of our goals is you know, um, as educators, as teaching teachers, and hoping they get involved and want to continue the program. But as long as we have funding for it, we will continue to do this. That's wonderful. I see a question from the audience. How did you get the teachers to participate in the program? I wasn't in on that part, but our education, K through 12 education department has very good connections. They've been working for years and years and years with, um, school systems in Baton Rouge, Tyrone Parish, Lafourche Parish, different areas. And so they have they have some ongoing relationships. And so they were able to get the teachers through those. Hi, um, thanks. This is a great project. Um, I, my question is similar. It's about contacting the teachers and whether it was targeting specific grades or specific curricular objectives, because it looks like you were doing it across the curriculum. Um, so I'm just curious about how that was designed and if it was intentional or if it's more opportunistic that a teacher says, oh, this is really great. I can put it in my ninth grade algebra class. I know on this one, uh, they were targeting grade school, um, some of the, the upper elementary, fourth through six, I think. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how they went about that, but they're trying to get it implemented into all of our schools eventually. And just a side note, um, one of somebody was talking about tourism earlier. Our tourism department has taken on the project of um, Keep Louisiana Beautiful, which is part of Keep America Beautiful. And so now we're, we are start, we've already started partnering with them on other projects with marine debris cleanup in marinas, um, uh, Bayou Days and different things, and all of our libraries have cleanup materials for anybody in the community that wants to do a cleanup. They can go get all the materials they need, do the cleanup, and bring it back. So it's kind of cool. We have any more questions? Okay, well, I'll go on to my next one. <laughs> okay. And, okay, so this is a NOAA Marine Debris Symposium uh, presentation that's understanding financial vulnerabilities to reduce marine debris and enhance coastal resilience. So this is a partnership with, um, you can go to the next slide, um, with Dr. Matt Fannin and LSU Ag Center and all of my other colleagues on this that's sitting in Alexandria doing training right now. <laughs> okay. So um, we, you know, unfortunately, we not only have a watershed, we get debris from the other side. And so he, he built um, a financial model on marine debris after storms. Because unfortunately, in the last 20, well, since 2005, we've had 20 named storms hit Louisiana. Of course, everybody remembers Katrina, Rita, Gustav, Ike, and the last ones are Laura, Zeta, Delta, Ida. Those were the worst of all of them, but then you had tropical storms in between there and stuff. And so he went in and um, built this financial um, marine debris model where they inputted from the, all these past storms the amount of marine debris that was collected afterwards, what the cost was, what type it was, and it correlates to the type of storm whether it was a Cat 5 or a tropical storm, whether it was a water event from storm surge being on the wrong side of the storm, or whether it was a wind event. So this is all in this model. Uh, and they created this for uh, local governments to be able to use, to be able to make it, to estimate what their debris cleanup might be after a storm, either before it approaches or after. 
And that way they can make decisions. Okay, are we going to do this locally? Do we need to get a third party? How long is this going to take? And so, but it was very difficult to use because each municipality had to put all their own information in. So in this program, they're making it much easier to use where um, like, a, you know, the way our, we're set up now, we have parishes, you have counties. Our parish, all the little towns in our parish are all under the parish, all under the county. But the parish next door, all their little towns are little municipalities that each do things individually. So this made it easier where they can just do a drop down, pick their area, and then get the information that they need. So that's the first part of this project. And so, um, so we're basically working on, on improving this, but also getting our youth programs and educate audiences on the impacts of green debris and to promote stewardship through litter cleanups and also to leverage and enhance the pre-existing litter cleanup events to promote stewardship um, behaviors. And a lot of this is we're looking at pre-storm cleanup um, to help with. Next slide. So like I said, this um, basically what he's doing, he's developing local government officials um, to help them planning financial costs all the different size storms and the different things that they need to do. Clean, clean up, we've, we're becoming pros at cleanup, unfortunately. Next slide. So we're improving the friendliness, but also simplifying the needed information from users to, to two variables, the municipality name, the storm severity, because once you, you have those, so you've got location and you've got severity and then it pulls from all of this data that's already in there. Um, and so I basically gave you all this in the introduction. Next slide. So one of the things is we're bringing this into our youth programs. And these are, we have other youth programs that are doing marine cleanup and stuff, but these are three new ones um, under this program. So we have March, March Dogs, that's the summer camp for high schools. We have a youth education, adopt a pond, it's middle school and high school, and adopt a park is middle school and high school. So we started these three this year and we're gonna have continuation next year. Next slide. And so what they're doing is real world data collection. Um, they're doing water quality where they're each taking their own water samples, doing the testing, finding out about the microplastics and other things that are in the water. And then they're, they're documenting that. Um, and they're also, um, doing much like the other program is doing the quantification on how much litter they're pulling up and what type it is and all that. So in one of these, they do a, a choose your character, which is fun. So you pick, you know, you're going to be a turtle, you're a snake, you're a frog, you're a bird, whatever. And then they give them a list of, okay, these are the types of things that these species eat. Now you're starving now. You know, pick out what you're going to eat as much as you want. And then they go back and analyze, okay, what kind of plastics are in that food? Because some of the food chain has plastics in it. We know that now. And so then they determine, okay, you ate this much of this. Oh, my God, you died. You're full of plastic. Or you can keep eating, but you're going to get fuller and fuller faster and faster. Because as the plastics bioaccumulate, you have less room for food. So that's the genesis of that one. And then they do a silent auction where they have um, a table with, you know, like styrofoam, plastic, material, uh, different, you know, metal can, different things, and, and they go down and rate how long they think it takes for this to to uh, dis disintegrate or whatever. And so whichever point gets it closest number, uh, they win. But then they go into talking about how these, these are the big pieces you we picked up. But what happens over time while that's breaking down? Styrofoam cup is a good example. That thing gets beat around in the environment. It breaks into pieces and it's little pieces. And so we may have a bigger problem with all the small little pieces than just the big pieces. And it makes them more aware when you're walking around. Look to see the small pieces. What are you seeing? And so helping them to identify beyond just the big pieces that we see that we can pick up and put in the trash. Next slide. So this is just the numbers. Um, by the end of 2025, we're going to have 515 students reached. And then um, this is showing on the, um, this is like Punch Train, St. Bernard, Bio Lafouche. That's where the three new ones are going to be done. And then this leads into other community things where there's a Bio Lafouche cleanup, which is outside of the school. Storm Sweep, um, there's a new one in St. Bernard, and there's some others that are developing. So you know, next slide. So we're looking at, by the end of next year, 10,500 pounds of litter and 150 volunteers. Next slide. 
And so the outcomes, you know, we want this to be something where we have knowledgeable partners, but that they also, most of our community is no sea grant when it comes to uh, disaster recovery, fisheries, coastal restoration. We want them to understand that we're also a partner in, in this too, that we can help them to educate their students and the communities in, in uh, litter. And then we, the cleanups, we want them to be visible short term with benefits at each location. And a big part of this is helping with the financial capacity to deal with vulnerability for marine and related disasters. And most of these areas when where that disasters really hit are underserved, you know, low income um, Native American communities that we work with. And next slide. And so uh, we're gonna, the model will be ready uh, in the spring. We're gonna have all the lessons ready by summer of 2025. Uh, the outreach signs for the adoptive park and pond programs, and then working with community uh, partners to plan for the next ones. Next slide, I think that's, and that is it. We have time for questions. Yeah, I have a question for you. Have you encountered any barriers when you've been implementing these programs with the schools? And if so, how have you been able to overcome them if you've had any barriers? None that I know of, and that goes back to the relationships that we've had with these schools for so long. Um, I find sometimes on other things that I've worked with, if it's a new school, then it's kind of, you know, mostly mostly communications because they don't understand our program, we maybe don't understand them. But the ones that we've had relationships with for years, you know, the principal has usually been there a long time. The, scientists, whatever, and so um, it's made it a lot easier to to work in these schools. And then word of mouth will go to another one and say, hey, look, you know, like Carol, the agent in, uh, on the North Shore, she has this really good program, you might want to do this. And so it, it's, it's just the network, doing the networking and getting to know the community. That's wonderful. Any questions? Thank you. Um, I can ask another question if okay. you like. Um, are there any other programs aside from the three that you're planning to implement? Do you have any plans for any other programs aside from Adopt a Pond or Adopt a Lake? There, that's something that's growing because, like I said, we just started. We did our first marine cleanup with um, uh, Keep Louisiana Beautiful, okay? And so we're going to do more of those. And that one was done just in time. That one came right after Hurricane Francine. It was already planned. And then Hurricane Francine, the eye came through Cocodry, and that's where the cleanup was. And so, uh, but we're looking at in each of our areas, especially pre storm cleanup before hurricane season, helping to get out there. Um, and do a, like a bayou day cleanup or a lake cleanup and doing these different things. We're also very involved in um, the derelict crab trap program, which every year uh, the wildlife and fisheries closes certain waterways and they go in for a week and just clean up the, the abandoned crab traps. Uh, we, and so we have those, we have, um, especially after storms with our trawlers with their on uh, nets catching anything from a refrigerator, you know, to whatever in their TEDs, helping them quantify that and, and identify those things. And so, we're, like I said, we're becoming professionals at cleanup. And so, <laughs> and everybody sees the need. And that's the good thing, because when this last storm came, we actually had people were motivated to go out and instead of wait for the government, clean their own drains. You know, it's the little things. Go outside and look in front of your house and see if that drain needs to be clean so water can flow. And so uh, I'm finding a really a really good response with people getting involved now. Before, we'd have cleanup days and you might have a few. Now you have a cleanup day, you have 20, 30 show up. So it's it's, it's growing. It's, it's really um, catching on. That's great to see that growth. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next presenter. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, our next presenter it, um, will be Kelly Thornelson. 
and um, the top project title is Our Marsh, Our Marsh Counts, <laughs> A Watershed Approach to Marine Debris Reduction in South Carolina's Seafood Capital. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, huge thanks to NOAA and Sea Grant for this opportunity. This is, I've been working in marine debris and plastic pollution for about um, nine years now, and this is my first uh, federal grant, so very excited. Um, I'd like to just start by uh, recognizing our coalition partners. We have, um, of course, South Carolina Sea Grant, a couple of folks that are here. We are so grateful for your support and all you do in South Carolina for natural resources. We have the Gullah Geechee Chamber Foundation, uh, Merle Zimlet 2020, Chirping Birds Society, Georgetown County Park, Parks and Recreation, uh, Sustain Coastal, which is the sustainability arm of Coastal Carolina University. We also uh, have brought in Coastal Waccamaw Stormwater Education Consortium. Unfortunately, I did not um, have them uh, on, included on this slide before. Um, and then, of course, my home away from home, the South Carolina Aquarium. And before I get into um, into the project, I want to talk about why the South Carolina Aquarium is in plastic pollution mitigation. Next slide. So we have a sea turtle hospital at the aquarium, and just uh, we started rehabilitating turtles just after opening in 2000. And over the years, we've seen a dramatic increase of sea turtles coming in with plastics in their GI tracts. And that was in 2015 that we decided we really needed to get beyond our walls to work on plastic pollution. We had been we had adopted a, a portion of one of our beaches for years and been doing cleanups. Uh, so we thought, how can we make that more meaningful? We wanted to start doing data collection during our cleanups. Um, and so we looked at all the litter trackers out there and, um, and there were no litter trackers with open source data. Uh, we wanted to be able to input data, um, but also use those data. And we wanted to encourage communities around South Carolina to input data but without being able to extract those data and use them for conversations around solutions, um, we decided to create our own. Next slide. So we worked with the Mount Desert Island Biological Laboratory. Next slide, please. We worked with uh, MDIBL in Bar Harbor, Maine to create Litter Journal. It's the first of um, several citizen science projects that can be found in the South Carolina Aquarium Citizen Science app available on all mobile devices. Um, and um, we, yes, it's completely open source. Next uh, slide, please. And we have essentially over the years ramped up our work in working with individuals and groups to train them on litter sweeps with data collection. Uh, we host approximately 50 sweeps a year, uh, sometimes with corporate groups and, and closed groups, um, but many of them are open to the public, and we really encourage people to not only learn how to collect solid uh, litter data, but then to do this on their own in their neighborhoods or in their communities, um, and to, to basically look for sources or the most problematic debris and ultimately find sources of those debris. Litter data are critical for that. Next. So this is South Carolina. We're really a state that's all connected by this intricate web of waterways. And these are just the main river systems here. But it became apparent pretty quickly that we couldn't be working just along the coast on litter and plastic pollution because we of this connection. So we, a um, couple of years after we uh, kicked off the Litter Journal, which was early 2017, it was about 2019 that we began working up uh, in inland communities in earnest. Next slide. So we developed the Pam and D. Michael Wilson Plastic Free Waters Program to begin this work. Next slide. And these are the data that have been collected throughout South Carolina and entered into the litter journal. Each hexagon here represents anywhere from one to you know, many uh, observations. And an observation can be anywhere from one piece of debris to you know, 10,000 or, or uh, endless numbers of debris. So uh, these are a tremendous amount of data here. Next slide. So years of data have not only allowed us to do things like contribute to many of the 19 single-use plastic bans in South Carolina, 
uh, implement two smoking bans on Charleston area beaches, um, stave off the ban on bans, which I've heard some about as we're here. That came, you know, it was in the House and Senate subcommittees multiple times over something like three or four years, and and we were really able to provide data to help stave that uh, that ban on bans off. Um, we most recently there's a loophole in many single-use plastic bands, the thick plastic bags are used where there are plastic bag bands and we're able to close that loophole um, with the help of litter data from the litter journal. Um, in four, four municipalities in Charleston County and we're hoping to do that in other uh, municipalities that have these bands. But we're also now we have years of data in the litter journal and we're able to track what's happening with those bands like the smoking uh, decline in smoking debris that is on the Alf Palms Beach. Next slide. All right, I'm getting to the project here. <laughs> All right, this is Sandra Bundy. Sandra is a lifelong resident of Merle's Inlet. It's in the northern part of the coast of South Carolina. And she uh, has, she just was witnessing this incredible increase in single-use plastics showing up um, on the waterfront area. She's, she's a broker, a real estate broker, but she also volunteers in a lot of different ways, including with the Chirping Bird Society. Next slide. So this is Merle's Inlet. This is um, on the inlet itself. Uh, the boardwalk that you see here, it's called the Marsh Walk. And there it's that, that Marsh Walk is lined with businesses, mostly restaurants and bars. Um, and hundreds of thousands of people use this Marsh Walk every year on the waterfront. And the restaurants here are very busy. And just FYI, the um, uh, uh, Merle's Inlet population is not quite 11,000. So this is a relatively small community, but it's been growing um, it, it, incredibly fast over the last few years. Next slide. This is just a quick uh, map of where Merle's Inlet is along the coast and my red arrow somehow in transferring to, to a PDF um, moved the arrow supposed to be pointing to the Marsh Walk area on the um, on the, the inlet there. But, but Sandra said let's get together some partners and start doing these cleanups with data collection so we can really really identify these most problematic debris and that's what that flyer is. Next slide. So this is the first kickoff our marsh count cleanup we did in 2022. It was incredible. And um, next slide, we found some um, we found lots and lots of straws and cigarette butts. Cigarette butts are always um, uh, the, the big problem, right? But but it was really easy to know where these debris were coming from because they were near the businesses. And we're not here to point fingers at businesses. We just want to help businesses. Um, not have a negative impact on the environment that is bringing them so much business, right? The reason people are there is because they're waterfront. Next. So, so this is a very busy data analysis slide of all of the debris that were um, uh, uh, counted and recorded in 2022. It's really interesting, very different than any other municipality. Straws came in second to, to cigarette butts. And so like straws are a really, really big problem there. Um, and, and lots of other things here. Next slide. This is the litter data that has been um, collected in Rolls Inlet. Next slide. And here, one project outline. So we're just getting started. What I didn't add here uh, in my haste was what we've already done. So we had our, uh, our coalition partner kickoff meeting in September in person. It was fantastic. We have hired a marketing firm to uh, develop a logo for the project and start building out a website. That website will host um, calendar of events and information on plastic pollution. It will also host what is kind of at the core of this three-year project for us, and that's an inlet-friendly business program. We'll have an inlet-friendly business guide that will have sourcing information and, um, and, and like perks that we plan to give to businesses for uh, becoming inlet-friendly. And the beautiful thing about this is this inlet-friendly business program is a, a program that was in the watershed committee, I'm sorry, watershed program, developed for Merle's Inlet in 2014. However, it was never um, implemented. So this is the watershed committee has reinvigorated um, uh, part, partially because of this project, I believe. And, um, and, and it, it just gives more oomph behind the program. Of course, um, there's a lot of community engagement here that will be hiring interns um, to help support the project. 
we'll create a, a business advisory council to help advise on how we communicate with businesses. We'll be doing surveys, creating messaging campaigns, um, hosting educational workshops and inviting all stakeholders um, uh, to that. We'll be working closely with the Gullah Geechee Chamber Foundation to host roundtables and work specifically with the Gullah Geechee community. We'll engage the fishing community on water-based cleanups and providing incentives uh, for that. There are multiple festivals that are very single-use plastic heavy, so we'll be greening those festivals. And the business guide is going to start creation in year one. So with that, thank I'll just say thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. We have time for some questions. Everyone's ready for lunch. I can always come up with a question. Uh, thanks, Kelly, that is, that's really great. Do you have ideas for what's gonna be part of the business-friendly guide, like in terms of what you might say, for instance, about straws or whatever you are thinking might go in that? Well, these businesses, it's not really so much seasonal anymore. These businesses are busy year round and they're just extremely busy. And if they don't have the knowledge or understanding of, of what the issues are, or how to remedy them. Um, that's what the, we're there to provide some ideas on how to reduce. I mean, just having additional waste receptacles in their outdoor spaces where these things are ending up, kind of right by the marsh walk, is really important. Some additional signage, maybe straws are given inside but not outside, right? So there are different, like just some ideas on how to do that. Um, sourcing sourcing different products so it's not all single-use plastic cups or so 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 we want to take the work out of it for them and to say here's everything you need to know to purchase differently or to uh, provide better ways for this waste to actually not end up in the environment thank you we're going to move on to the next presentation but thank you thank so much you. The next project is the Brooklyn Queens Marine Debris Cleanup Program, presented by Matt Molina. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matt Molina. I am the director of NYC H2O. And um, we're very appreciative to Noah for giving us this opportunity to work with New York Sea Grant, which is an organization that we've been hoping to partner with for years. So it's a great opportunity. And also another local NGO, RISE, who focuses on Rockaway. Um, next slide, please. And one more slide. So New York City is... Uh, a coastal town um, we developed because of our harbor and uh, so there's uh, five boroughs in New York City four of them are on islands Manhattan is an island Staten Island is an island and Brooklyn and Queens are at the western terminus of Long Island over here so this here is this here is Jamaica Bay um, can you go to the next slide so zoomed in Rockaway is at the southern end of Jamaica Bay, and Canarsie is at the northern end. Um, before uh, the federal government passed the Clean Water Act, uh, New York sent its raw sewage right into the, the harbor. So the coastal areas were undesirable because they were stinky. So a lot of housing developments uh, were built along the coast, and so uh, over time, these became uh, underserved areas. And uh, so Canarsia is one such area. In fact, the beach uh, right opposite to where we're cleaning up has a housing project similar for, for Rockaway. Next slide, please. 
So Raz does great work in in Rockaway. That's a, a neighborhood in Queens, and it's on that uh, that southern barrier island. Next slide, please. And H2O does environmental education programs. We bring kids to reservoirs uh, to learn about the drinking water system. And the great thing about New York City is our water comes from the Catskills unfiltered. Nature cleans our water. Nature takes care of us. We have to take care of nature. It's something we all, can all connect to. Um, and we also bring kids to the beach to learn about marine ecology. And we prefer that they have a pleasant experience um, and see beautiful nature rather than a lot of garbage. So we do a lot of beach cleanups. And uh, uh, we also use these big maps. Um, you can print pretty much anything on anything these days. So uh, we have these eight foot by six foot canvas maps that we use. and. Uh, a great resource. Uh, we have a lot of interns, and uh, here we're partnering uh, with Coca-Cola. Uh, I, I know they've been mentioned a few times, and uh, so they're uh, they're a partner. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we're uh, we're doing cleanups in in Canarsie and and Rockaway, which are two underserved areas. Next slide, please. So RISE is doing uh, some educational uh, field trips. Uh, we're doing six cleanups per year altogether. So this was, um, we just started in September. As soon as we got word that the, the contract was going through, we got right to it. And uh, I'll show you pictures from the first two cleanups in, uh, in a minute. Uh, we're doing civic engagement uh, to involve our community and what they can do to uh, in, prevent uh, marine litter. Uh, in New York State, we've been trying uh, for years to pass extended producer responsibility. Hasn't happened yet, um, but maybe this will be the year. And uh, we're going to do everything we can to, to let folks know about it. We also have a bigger, better bottle bill um, that uh, we've been trying to pass. So another thing to, to educate people about. Um, and we're using the MD map. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, and for those of you who don't remember, the MD map is NOAA's uh, data tracking uh, app for uh, litter. Uh, this was our first cleanup. In New York City, we have a lot of garbage, um, but we have a lot of people. So that's a great resource for New York City. So in our first cleanup in Canarsie, we had 150 volunteers, and uh, we also did seining so that the volunteers could see uh, the marine animals that they were protecting by taking out this plastic and all this garbage. Here, Janelle, who's one of our interns, uh, is holding a snapper uh, uh, when we're taken out of the net. Uh, those are a bunch of college students from uh, St. John's University, which is nearby. Uh, we also worked with the Bayview Houses, the housing project that's across the highway from the beach. Next slide, please. Uh, this was a floating dock. It was about uh, the size of the screen, and uh, it was sitting there for a couple of years. Uh, this particular beach in Canarsie happens to be owned by the federal government. In the 70s, the city was down and out. There was a, a headline in the paper, uh, New York City, go to hell. That was um, something that uh, Gerald, President Gerald Ford had said, and the city was bankrupt. So they sold a bunch of land in Jamaica Bay to the feds. And so uh, we have a national park called Gateway National uh, Recreation Area. Anyway, um, for whatever reason, I don't quite get it. National Park Service doesn't really take care of, of the beaches. Um, so uh, we do. And um, so we, we got rid of that. We cut it up. Um, the next slide, please. And unfortunately, would you go back inside? I wonder if you click on that. We we made a little video. Can you see if it works? It might not. I don't. Oh well. Let's anyway, we cut it up and and we took it off, and um, it was quite heavy. So uh, done. Next slide, please. Uh, this was out in Rockaway. They had a hundred volunteers and. Uh, yeah, you, you get this kind of stuff. People drive up with pickup trucks, um, unscrupulous contractors, and 
they just dump their stuff and so uh, we come along and, and clean it up. Uh, they also planted 2,000 plugs of beach grass to stabilize the dunes. Next slide, please. This is, see if that video works, because this is uh, some of the, the youth that Rise uh, employs. They're getting out some, uh, some appliances that were uh, dumped on the beach. This is uh, we had to upload them into the platform ahead of time, so. They don't work. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. And there are the volunteers planting uh, uh, beach grass plugs. Next slide, please. And uh, there's my contact info at the top. I'm Matt Molina from H2O. Uh, Rise is a, another great organization. And then we, again, partner with the New York Sea Grant. Presentation. Um, I'm in the Philly metro area, and C and D waste is a huge issue for us with the legal dumping. Have you, um, besides cleaning it up, like found any solutions or getting folks to, to deter, to stop dropping C and D waste? Uh, all in all, we we've been doing beach cleanups for uh, about six years there's been less and less waste. There are some problem areas. Fortunately, New York City, um, they, through the Department of Sanitation, they've been putting up uh, enforcement cameras. Um, and the enforcement cameras have surveillance, but they also have license plate readers. So th those have been effective. They've been slow to roll them out, um, but where they go in, they, they, they have been effective. Um, do you know if New York has, um, like, what the costs are for contractors to go dump their waste legally? Because I, like, in Milwaukee, that's something that we've struggled with, is that you have to have, like, an ID. And so if we have folks who are operating, like, under the radar, they don't have legal ways that they can dump their waste except for in the rivers. And so we're just trying to figure out, like, how to, how to help make that process easier, reduce barriers for people to do it legally while also helping them pick up the trash. It's a great idea. I don't know the answer, but I will tell you from experience, I'll be walking out of Home Depot with a few boxes of garbage bags and, you know, some people will approach me and ask me, you know, do I need help throwing out my garbage? And that's, you know, uh, an unscrupulous vendor that's going to come with a truck and just dump it on the side of the road or, or by the beach. So there, there's a black market for it. So it's there must be some incentives to uh, to make that be happening. We have time for one more question. Thanks for sharing about your work, Matt. Lisa Watkins, Washington Sea Grant. Um, I admire your efforts to um, collect data while you're doing these beach cleanups using MD Map. I'm curious how that's actually felt in practice, having a group of students out there and actually trying to do this data collection alongside. Yes, it, it's been met with enthusiasm, and um, the we we had mixed results though. Um, for the Canarsie cleanup in September, there uh, we did it around high tide, and there was a super tide. And um, it's um, we have to schedule the the cleanups are best done in the morning before there's a lot of traffic and when people are available. So it doesn't always line up with the tides. So um, our results were a little mixed because we had the super uh, tide that day. So there was enthusiasm that the, the students were into it. They wanted to participate, uh, but. Um, while we got a, a pre-survey, we uh, the the, the post-survey got a little interrupted. Thank you. That's all the time we have for questions. We'll move on to our last presenter. Before we... Right, our last project uh, before we break is the Low Country Network. 
building a coalition of community members, shrimpers, educators, and conservationists to remove and recycle marine debris, presented by Brooke Seri. All right, I'm standing between you and lunch, so let's get this. <laughs> All right, so I'm talking to, I'm representing our partners on the Low Country Network. And this, our partners for this project are the University of Georgia Marine Extension, Georgia Sea Grant, and the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, and ourselves, South Carolina Sea Grant Consortium. There are multiple members of each of these organizations working on this project collectively. So the Low Country Network is an extension of an existing project called Trial to Trash. And so we were funded in the first round of the community co coalition grants. And so this project is focusing on prevention and education outreach, as well as support for different community members. Next slide. So of course, we're gonna be right before lunch. So let's talk about shrimp. <laughs> More like shrimp and Jason. So Trial to Trash started as a way to provide a funding source for shrimpers during COVID. And so also to help them with their derelict nets that take up space on their boats, on the docks, end up as marine debris in some cases. And so uh, the premise behind the Trawl to Trash program is we pay the shrimpers $20 a bag and they create stow bags out of their derelict nets. And uh, for this project, we wanted to continue to provide that opportunity for our shrimpers in Georgia and South Carolina. And uh, so we've been, we're in, just started year two. So in year one, we paid out over $13,000 to our shrimpers uh, to create these bags. Next slide. So now we have all these bags. We are getting 400 bags uh, each year during this grant for each state. So what are we gonna do with them? And so that's the purpose of this project is really to promote not only the upcycling and use, and, but also individual responsibility and prevention and education and um, bring together different community members in these efforts. And so, um, so far we have between the two states, we are doing a multiple approach. So each partner has their own outreach and education plan that they're implementing separately. But then we also have opportunities that we are coming together that are unique to this project, which I'm gonna go into in a minute. But some of the different outreach efforts that we have done uh, in this first year have been marine debris collaborator workshops. And so this brought together people doing marine debris education and outreach and work in Georgia and uh, South Carolina. They came together and talked about their needs. What are we doing? How can we collaborate and uh, moving forward from there? And so uh, that will continue into uh, another workshop coming up. And then um, bag maker and educator workshops. So Georgia is much better at creating those bags than South Carolina Sea Grant. We all failed. We apparently can't tie a trawl knot, um, but the, Georgia has been doing it a little bit longer. So they're, in addition to supporting their shrimpers, and y'all were supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> and uh, they are also creating uh, different events where the people in the events and the workshops are creating bags as well. So they are um, able to spread that knowledge and work uh, a little bit further than we are um, because they started earlier as they created the Trawl Trash Project. So we are coming in um, in South Carolina and working on what our outreach looks like with that on that end. And so we also have tabling events and cleanups as part of this project. And uh, we are working together with the corridor to bring in the cultural components into all these efforts. Next slide. One of the other really neat parts about this project is our student engagement. So each partner has, or each state has a a uh, summer intern, a community engaged intern, uh, which is a program that South Carolina, or I'm sorry, that Sea Grant has around the country. And so we are able to bring in undergrad interns that focus on a project or a community within the different states, as well as we have a graduate assistant who is dedicated to all of our marine debris portfolio projects, who helps to implement, mentor, and, and uh, put out in, sorry, and create these outreach opportunities. Next slide. So the student projects range from tabling events, 
uh, to how creating a video for our shrimpers on how to make a stow bag, uh, and then creating our websites and actually putting together the logistics for our large events. Next slide. And so as part of this event, we're not only leveraging the existing events and finding ways to uh, incorporate child to trash into those events, but also we wanted to do something that was unique to this project and brought all the partners together. So both states and uh, brought in the corridor to really create something we could sponsor. So we're calling it a child to trash sponsored event. And so we did this this summer, it was called Maritime Days. And this was a way to experience a day in the life of your estuary. And so we brought everyone down to Port Royal Sound Foundation, which is in Southern South Carolina on the coast. And um, during this event, we gave people the opportunity to learn about their estuary, learn about their area. They, we also, the uh, corridor, our student, and um, our marine life uh, extension agent put together a list of amazing cultural demos. And so these were opportunities to hear about different cultural aspects within the estuary that uh, the estuary provides. Sweetgrass basket weaving, uh, chef demonstrations, um, different day in the life of a shrimper, uh, everything you can think of, including a fishing clinic. Next slide. And so through these, we also had uh, 19 different interactive displays that talked about various forms of marine debris education and prevention. Next slide. And then we also brought in 200 attendees at this event from the community. And so it was really well received. And um, one of the uh, neat things was our, the corridor during this time has been building up their staff. And this event was the first time that they were able to bring all their staff together um, in one place. And so that was a really neat uh, aspect. Next. Our, ne our other event that we're doing is a water-based cleanup, which was a need that was expressed to us by our, D our uh, natural resource state agency. And so we did a small form of that, which was a one day, everyone get on a boat, let's go to an island and clean it up. And we're using this to look at what kind of trash uh, we need to prepare for, how best to use the child trash bags in these water-based cleanups, and test out our data forms. And so through this, we are going to be planning a larger event next year using the data that we got from this event. Next. And so uh, we had about 45 people that came out. They paid $5 to get a boat ride. We educated them on marine debris uh, through the boat ride to the island. And then they had a beautiful, wonderful day that I didn't get to attend because I had COVID. But that's okay. I heard lots of great things and I'm not sad at all. Next. <laughs> And so with that, I want to thank you. We have time for audience questions. Thank you for your presentation, Brooke. The, the debris derby light, who were the vessels that were transporting the people? Was that a partnership and were the $5, was that like a deposit to ensure that people showed up? I'm so glad that you asked that because it was due to time, I couldn't put it in there. Uh, so we have a nature-based operator that is acting as a pilot for us and they are testing the use of the bags in their natural resource or they're in their naturalist programming for the different efforts that they do. And so we called them up to ask if they would be interested in partnering with us to do this event. And, uh, and so they suggested the different styles that they could do and then we supplemented the cost. So we paid a higher cost through our grant to use the boat, but it was a, uh, but the $5 we did just to ensure people felt an investment and showed up. We did have a wait list um, and we had about five or seven people that didn't show up, but we had some extras that did, so it worked out. Um, about how long does it take to make the bags? Depends on the person. Me, about eight hours. Um, <laughs> a shrimper, about, I don't know, Matt, what, 15 minutes, if that. Good luck. Good luck. You can probably do it in 
those that are particularly adept can probably do it in yeah, 15, 20 minutes. Some shrimpers might take longer, but we have some high performers that we continue to work with. So. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any other questions? And we have a template and the video and um, Georgia and ourselves have various forms that we use to work with the shrimpers on how to create the bags. But really the shrimpers know how to do it. They figured it all out. We, we just give them supplies. <laughs> Yes, definitely be sure to check out their website and see some of their cool videos. If we don't have any other questions, we can go ahead and move on to lunch. Thank you. Um, because we want to go ahead and give Brooke some applause. Thank you, Brooke. Um, and since we ran a little over time, we will return from lunch at 2.15 for our next session. So we will be starting in the auditorium at 2.15.